Thanks for inviting me. As Bettina said, I'm from the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. I work mainly with coastal ecosystems and foremost coastal fish in the Baltic Sea. And I'm sharing an expert group or expert network since almost 10 years uh, on coastal fish in, in the Baltic Sea. So I will give a presentation, a little bit of an overview in the essence of, of coastal, the status and, 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 and uh, structure of coastal ecosystems in the Baltic Sea. And then I will focus a lot on coastal fish issues. Uh, uh, the status, as we know it, um, impacts and uh, what we can do to support uh, and restore coastal fish populations. In its essence, the Baltic Sea consists of two major habitats. And I think Peter has touched quite a lot on this as I, I only uh, joined in for a 15 minute presentation, but I, I, what, I, what I, my uh, impression from Peter's talk was that you talk both about the coastal and offshore Baltic. So the offshore Baltic is basically a large massive body water body, a homogeneous habitat, quite few species. There are a few, few fish species, mainly, or was mainly cod, uh, today mainly herring and sprat, stickleback, and some uh, uh, benthic living species uh, like uh, flatfishes. And also, of course, some uh, animals, uh, invertebrates in the, in, in the bottom, uh, and also some birds, uh, uh, seals and, and uh, occasionally some harbor porpoise swimming through this, this habitat. <clears throat> uh, we as human mainly impact this habitat by uh, fishing, boating, I should perhaps say shipping due to sound and occasionally uh, oil leakages and stuff, but it happens very seldom, luckily in the Baltic Sea. Uh, so mainly it's a large scale um, climate and eutrophication that impacts these offshore habitats. Whereas at the coast, we have a more heterogeneous habitat, uh, Peter said that, we have archipelagos, exposed, uh, uh, shallow, deep areas. Um, it, it's a lot of heterogeneity around the Baltic Sea. It's a biodiversity hotspot, we have many species, many fish species, a mixture of marine species and freshwater species. Uh, a lot of nesting sites for birds, uh, uh, today feeding areas for, for, for seals. Uh, and uh, we as human, this is where we like to hang out. Uh, we build houses, boating, fish, uh, we do a lot of things here. So it's a wide plethora of impact on coastal ecosystems. So <clears throat> the Baltic Sea food webs in, it, in, its, uh, in short, it looks like this. We have, of course, top predators, apex predators as, as uh, harbor porpoise, uh, marine mammals, seals, birds, humans. Uh, we have pelagic, coastal, and benthic fish, zooplankton, phytoplankton, and bacteria. So, and I will focus my talk on, on, on this coastal part here. So, um, a couple of years ago, me and some colleagues around the Baltic, we assembled data on um, uh, coast, coastal ecosystem components in 13 different uh, uh, coastal ecosystems. So <clears throat> this data ranged from phytoplankton up to seals in some areas. In some areas, we only included fish and uh, benthic fauna, for example. But it, I think the, the data ranged from, from, um, from three to five or six trophic levels in each area. So at least this was also an, 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 uh, uh, an um, uh, thing we did to really survey what data is there around to make full uh, ecosystem assessments in coastal areas. Uh, and uh, so we assembled all this data, we looked at the trends in all the different areas, and then we tried to depict common trends among areas. And what you see in this graph, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a complex statistical um, exercise, but what I want you to, to, to notice here is the, the black solid line, which actually uh, depicts a common development or trend of the majority of the systems uh, that we surveyed. And as you can see from the black trend, uh, black line, uh, most of the systems has follow a directional change from one state in the beginning of the 90s to another state in the beginning of 2010s. Uh, this doesn't mean that the same thing has happened in all coastal systems that we surveyed. And it might be that in some system, perch or stickleback increased, whereas in other, 
uh, stickleback and perch decreased. But at least this tells us that there has been a directional change in coastal ecosystems over time to a better or worse state. Uh, but coastal systems are undergoing change. Uh, <clears throat> having said that, uh, one of the biggest impacts on, on, on the Baltic Sea is, is eutrophication. Uh, but when looking at, at uh, uh, the eutrophication status in the different sub-basins and also in the different areas, you can see here that uh, the few green areas, uh, which are, is actually uh, um, classified as being in good status, are actually found in, along the coasts, uh, mainly in the northern part of the Baltic Sea. So even though coastal systems are impacted, as you can see on this picture I took this summer, uh, in the archipelago outside uh, Norrköping in, in central Sweden. Uh, they are relatively mildly impacted of eutrophication compared to offshore systems. Uh, <clears throat> but as I said, uh, they are hotspots for human interest. So we do fishing, both commercial, but to a large extent recreational fishing. And I will come back to that. We do a lot of bo boating, both uh, commercial, uh, leisure boating. And we build harbors that exploit uh, uh, essential habitats for, for the species living there. This is a area, it's quite poor shot, but it's an aerial photo of the Nortelje harbor in Sweden. You can see that's, oops, that's not, let's see what happened now. It's not much uh, green areas left uh, or blue areas, uh, habitats left here. Uh, coastal areas is also where we have a lot of industries uh, and, and release a lot of, of effluent water from, from industries, both power plants, nuclear power plants, but also um, pulp mills and various uh, types of uh, um, uh, industries. So coastal areas, they are hotspots for human interest, uh, both, both point sources, but also more diffuse activities as we humans uh, undertake during our leisure time. So if you want to summarize uh, coastal ecosystems in the Baltic Sea, and I think it's, it's quite valid worldwide, they are biodiversity hotspots, they are highly productive. And I think more and more uh, knowledge and, and evidence is accumulating that uh, coastal systems are actually act, uh, acting as sinks for greenhouse gases. For example, the huge uh, extension of reed belts in the Baltic Sea, they might actually serve as a, as a, a reservoir for for, for carbon storage, but also submerged vegetation, uh, um, uh, algae, macroalgae and, and other uh, aquatic and aquatic plants. They are in change and many uh, coastal systems have, have changed to poor status. Uh, and they are of substantial cultural, economic and recreational value and interest to us humans, and which means that they are true hotspots for impact. So following this, I will now focus, shift a little bit more on, on coastal fish in the Baltic Sea, which are key players in coastal ecosystems, both that they influence the dynamics and structure and function of coastal ecosystems, but they're also really good indicators of the state of coastal ecosystems. So by looking at the state of a fish population, you could uh, uh, extract information on, on the, on the, on the uh, state of the uh, whole system, actually. Or food web in, in the, at the coast. So, who are the players then, uh, which we um, depict coastal fish? So, it's <clears throat> mainly species of a freshwater uh, origin, resident local species as uh, perkids, perch and pike, for example, uh, perch and pike perch, and also pike. We have uh, cypernid fish as breams and roach and bleak, and also whitefish important but we also have uh, migratory species moving uh, uh, inshore and offshore throughout the life cycle uh, as herring and stickleback here. Nils every now and then appoints me to say that why don't you include eel and uh, of course eels are present in the coastal system but I would say I, I stick out my my uh, knows here and saying that they are of no importance to the co functioning of coastal ecosystems because they occur in so, so low abundances. And also they migrate between <laughs> Saragasso Sea, inland waters and the Baltic Sea. It's very hard to, to do an assessment of eel just looking at the coastal ecosystem. At the same, similarly, we uh, traditionally exclude uh, salmon and trout from coastal ecosystems due to the migratory behavior. So we focus very much on, on, on resident coastal fish species, even though herring and, and, 
and um, and sticklebacks are migrating from coast to offshore but the processes and the effects of these migrations uh, are uh, coming from the sea not the inland fresh waters for example so what's uh, uh, typical for i i kind of touched on this what's typical for coastal fish populations is their population structure if we look at for example the offshore fish uh, typical the cod for example um, or herring and um, uh, or sprat uh, they usually occur in large uh, and uh, few populations or stocks so for example the cod is divided into two stocks eastern and western cod stock where of course there's a migration between uh, for coastal fish it's a totally different uh, picture for the majority of the species they occur in many and small stocks and uh, separated by migration barriers or other uh, barriers cryptic barriers uh, so we have loads of, of, of small uh, semi or fully isolated populations so uh, they are also locally exploited and should be locally managed uh, so uh, uh, a fisheries management plan or an impacting pressure affecting for example perch down in the south of sweden might not be uh, applicable to perch in the north of Sweden because there are different impacting factors and, and you, the fish don't uh, swim between these areas. Whereas cod and offshore species, they are uh, an internationally shared resource. So uh, countries need to uh, agree on how to uh, manage these populations. So in a, set, in a way, it's easier with the um, coastal stocks since they are, you can make national uh, management plans but at the same time, you need uh, a local uh, approach and perspective for almost each coastal area. So <clears throat> looking on the state of, of coastal fish species. So within HELCOM, we have agreed on um, two common indicators that we survey the state of coastal fish communities by using these indicators. So it's uh, 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 the state of the key species, which in this case is perch or flounder in Denmark, which since perch are not occurring in, in, in Denmark. And we use a lot of monitoring data and you can see it's quite impressive network of monitoring stations, uh, but given the local appearance and structure of these coastal fish species, it's, uh, uh, I, I must say it's, it's, it's not enough we need much more monitoring anyhow uh, we did an assessment in 2018 using 2016 data and what you can see it's it's a lot of green dots indicating that the populations are doing okay but it's also a lot of red dots uh, when looking at the other indicators cyprinids which is then breams carp fishes uh, uh, roach and bleak and such uh, uh, the picture uh, slightly different picture appears um, and we have quite a lot of many red areas indicating in this case that there is a steady increase of this uh, uh, group of fish and uh, this group of fish are, are favored by eutrophication and climate change uh, so increasing abundances of cypernid fish is actually we interpret it as something bad for the system when updating this data we, we're about to to perform a, another uh, assessment for the holas 3 um, uh, project or assessment and when updating with data until 2020, actually a picture uh, that uh, uh, appears that is actually uh, reinforcing or strengthening this pattern. So we have further declines in, in perch and further increases in cypernid fish. So it, I think we're move, going to a, 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 a state where we actually get more and more cypernid dominated coastal areas and less uh, predatory fish dominated uh, coastal areas another not so important predator for the uh, for the system because they compared to perch because they uh, occur in, in in lower abundances but still iconic and, and important to the system is is the northern pike uh, we at the moment have no uh, common assessment for pike in the whole baltic sea we are actually working on it so we, we're going to do a, a common pike assessment, I think, in early next year, hopefully, fingers crossed. And uh, pike also occurs much more rarely in our, our uh, monitoring programs. But still, they occur. And I see, uh, I show a picture here from, from Swedish data, from, from those coastal monitoring sites where we 
catch pike. And it's a very devastating and, 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 and sad picture we see. We see quite sharp decreases in the abundances of pike in all monitoring areas almost. So the situation for pike in the Baltic Sea is coastal parts at least in Sweden is, is quite bad, almost alarming, I would say. Uh, and there have been proposals that pike should be red listed. I don't think red listed is, is, is not, it's not endangered, but I think we, we should be very careful uh, when fishing uh, for pike. And I, I think I support that there could be a ban of pike fishing, at least in Sweden. We need to leave this species alone. Even though it's a lot of catch and release uh, and not uh, directly uh, killing the, the fish, uh, there might be uh, quite negative effects of, of, of the catch and release fishing, especially since it's most intense during spawning time. Um, but of course, it's not only fishing that affects pike, it's a lot of other factors as well. And lately, seals are a huge uh, challenge for pike populations, I think, because they, they, they go into to the spawning base of pike and, and actually uh, kill a lot of spawners. Um, yeah, so uh, when we have already weakened populations, I think uh, the seals could have a strong negative impact as it is today on pike. <clears throat> Another uh, coastal fish species uh, of importance, at least in, in the northern part of the Baltic Sea, is whitefish. Uh, uh, as with pike, we don't have a, a common assessment in all Baltic countries, so I only show Swedish data. But here the picture looks a little bit different. Uh, it's very up and down, shaky figures, but you can see no down, real downward trends. Uh, on the uh, contrary, it's actually looking quite good in, for, for, for white fish, fish during later years. And this is a little bit strike, uh, uh, um, uh, no, I lost the word. It's a little bit uh, um, not strange, but surprising to me since pike, uh, white fish is a species that should not be favored by the environmental conditions that I have in the Baltic Sea now. But they are, seem to be doing quite okay. At least if you look at the uh, picture from the last 20 years. <clears throat> Another coastal predatory fish um, is pike perch. And first I would like you to draw your attention to this uh, picture in the lower uh, and the, the blue line here. Where you can see this is this is a, a, a collection of data on on landings or catches of, of pike perch in, in Swedish coastal areas during the past hundred years, and what you can see the, we virtually didn't catch any pike perch until the mid 70s, and the main reason for this is that pike perch is thriving in eutro eutrophied waters, and when eutrophication uh, kicked in in the Baltic Sea during the 70s. Uh, pike perch bloomed and people start to fish it heavily and as you can see now the catches has gone down uh, severely and when looking at the monitoring data this we catch very little pike perch even though the gear should catch a lot of pike perch and there's downward trends in, in majority of areas and what we also see there's very few pike perch above the 40 centimeters which is the minimum landing size so it's a tragedy the pike perch story in the Baltic Sea in the coastal areas in Sweden at least. Uh, but the light blue um, curve, can you see when I point my, with my, my, my pointer here? So uh, it's a strong up, upward trend until 2015. And this is an area where, where fishing was banned. And you can see what happens when fishing is banned. It increased massively. Uh, after 2015, the, 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 the ban was, was uh, the fishing was open again, and now we we'll see what will happen. I think my colleagues surveyed this bay uh, this year, so it's going to be interesting to see the results of this. So it's in southern Stockholm, archipelago. Another species that is on the rise is the three spine stickerback, and I think a lot of you heard uh, quite a, a lot about this. Uh, it's seldom that you see a s so strong and striking um, increase of a species in an exploited system as the Baltic Sea. Uh, but this is an unfished, unex unex almost unexploited fish species that migrates between coastal and offshore areas. It's um, uh, spawning in coastal areas at the same, very same 
time and a place as, as uh, pike and perch and roach are spawning uh, in the spring. After the, the, sp uh, after the first summer of life in, in the coastal area, it migrates out to the offshore area and there it spends the two, three years and then migrates back as an adult in sport. And <clears throat> there's no uh, uh, directed monitoring of, of, of sticklebacks in the Baltic Sea. But together with some colleagues, we have assembled data from available data sources and we so see a similar pattern in, in all data series. Stickleback has increased massively since the early 2000s. And sometimes I hear people say that stickleback is now the most common species of fish in the Baltic Sea, but that's absolutely not correct. Uh, since our estimate says that uh, that at maximum it, it, it constitutes about 15% of the total pelagic fish bi biomass. So still herring, even though how poor the condition herring is in now, uh, and sprat is absolutely dominant compared to stickleback, at least biomass wise, since this is a very small fish. But it's still it's striking that we see such an increase. And what is then the effect uh, of the stickleback increase uh, on the ecosystem? Uh, <clears throat> this is a mesopredatory uh, species found. Uh, it's an important prey for predatory fish, uh, but it's also uh, is a, is a fierce predator on low trophic levels. So uh, what we see uh, in data is in base where we have perch and pike dominance, predatory fish dominance, they have a strong predation pressure on sticklebacks. So there's very few sticklebacks in areas dominated, the coastal areas are dominated by pike and perch. Uh, and as such, there's quite a lot of mesograzers, uh, 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 favorite food for, for, for sticklebacks. And these mesograzers in turn uh, eats a lot of ephemer ephemeral algae so the, an underwater picture, could, you see healthy stands of, of, of uh, fucus, for example, and other submerged vegetation. In, a, in an area where there's very little uh, predatory fish, to some reason, it might be, as stated here, fisheries habitat lost or seal and cormorant predation, uh, sticklebacks flourish and thrive and occur in, 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 in uh, uh, huge numbers. Sticklebacks then can have a, a negative feedback on pred predatory fish by predating on uh, juvenile life forms of, of, of these predatory fish. At the same time, sticklebacks eat a lot of mesograzers and therefore release uh, um, ephemeral algae from predation. So a typical sticklebacks dominated bay looks like this. It's mats of filamentous algae overgrowing the, uh, the uh, underwater vegetation. So actually, uh, and what we see in 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 um, in, uh, in uh, a meta analysis and review studies is that the effects of these ephemeral algae on the uh, uh, in the system uh, can be as substantial uh, from stickleback predation as it is from nutrient um, uh, additions. So. Uh, you, we, when combating eutrophication symptoms, we cannot only focus on, on, on eutrophication leakage. We need to consider the structure of the fish population as well. So <clears throat> the same authors as showing the picture in, on the previous slide has done a quite cool animation here where they have looked at the, uh, the dominance patterns of, of uh, a lot of coastal bays in, in the in the uh, Stockholm archipelago. So the red base are dominated by sticklebacks and the blue base are dominated by predatory fish. And uh, since the 70s and until now, you can see that the sticklebacks is sweeping like a wave through the archipelago, uh, conquering um, uh, more and more bays uh, over time. So today it's uh, mostly the, the innermost and, and sheltered base that can harbor uh, predatory fish populations. So <clears throat> what is then impacting uh, coastal fish? So as I said, uh, the same with, with the, with the um, uh, coastal ecosystems is a multitude of factors, including climate, natural predation, competition, habitat quality, fishing, mainly in this sense, mainly recreational fishing, eutrophication, and hazardous substances. And I will try now to go through a few of these uh, and what effects they have. So, uh, I guess it's not new to any, anyone that climate change is, is impacting uh, the Baltic Sea. So here is a graph of showing the temperature development in the Baltic Sea during the past 
40 years and also projections in the future. And the same goes for salinity, which in the, is in the low panel. And what we have seen a, a quite steady increase in temperature uh, during the past uh, 40 years. But if you look at the 100 years period back, we see a steady increase in temperatures in the Baltic Sea. And uh, given the climate change scenarios, we will see a steady rise, continue steadily, steady rise. So in the end of the 21st century, actually, these, the, the mean temperature will increase uh, uh, at most three degrees, hopefully not more than, than one and a half. But this will affect the, the, the species composition. Uh, <clears throat> when we look at salinity, it's not uh, uh, really that clear what will happen. We have seen uh, 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 actually an increase in, in salinity during the last 40 years or so. Uh, uh, and the projected change is it, we might have a drop in salinity. Uh, at the end of the 21st century. But as you can see from the, the colored uh, area here, it's actually showing the, the, the confidence intervals of these projections. And you can see they are huge. So we might end up with a, a, a decrease, but we might also have end up with a steady state which is similar to now. Nevertheless, uh, 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 a warmer Baltic and less saline Baltic will impact coastal fish species. And we, we we have shown this in, in, in looking at historic uh, date uh, records, uh, but I will just show you a schematic view of how this could be. So if we have a cold and saline Baltic, which we actually had uh, uh, in the 80s and 70s. Uh, coastal systems were dominated by <coughs> whitefish, herrings, uh, cod, sculpins, and smelt, species favoring lower water temperatures. Whereas uh, uh, today, uh, 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 the winners in this climate race in the Baltic Sea is actually species of freshwater region, so, such as cypronate fish, but also perch, pike perch, and stickleback. Uh, all else being equal, I must say. So, uh, and we're pretty aware of that the Baltic Sea is a heavily eutrophied system. Uh, and of course, eutrophication also affects fish. So, if we have the two uh, extremes, an oligotrophic state, which we perhaps had in the Baltic Sea before the 70s, to the eutrophic state, eutrophic state that we have now, the eutroph eutrophic state uh, favors roach, bream, bleak, cypronid fish, stickleback, and also pike perch, all else being equal. The oligotrophic state favors uh, uh, species like whitefish and cod. And we also have something in between that perch and pike, they are not uh, the true winners when it's he heavily eutrophied, but they, they are favored by, to some extent, eutrophication. So they found something somewhere in between. <clears throat> when it comes to habit habitat loss and deg degradation, this is a typical uh, important uh, bay, shelter bay in, in the archipelago of Sweden uh, for spawning of, of, of this resident uh, coastal freshwater fish species like perch and pike, for example. Even though the submerged vegetation is heavily overgrown here by by filamentous algae, it's it's still this is still of importance. These kind of areas uh, and the main in coastal areas, the main the main uh, uh, factor uh, or pressure uh, or activity leading to a decreased status of of, of uh, uh, these essential habitats is actually uh, boating and, and re uh, creation of, of, of uh, uh, constructions as piers and, and uh, docks and harbors. So this is a take. This figure is taken from a, a paper by some colleagues of mine, where they looked at the availability of, of uh, uh, spawning habitat for pike, perch, and roach uh, at different uh, exploitation uh, rates of, of, of the shoreline. So this is the number of, of physical constructions on the x-axis for a 100 meter shoreline. And what you can see uh, already, if we increase the uh, number of constructions from one to three, we, we almost get almost half of the habitat is lost or more than half of the habitat for these species are, are, are lost. And if we go down to more than eight or increase to more than eight uh, constructions for a 100 meter shoreline, it's virtually no habitat left. And what we see in, in heavily exploited uh, uh, coastal areas, such as the Stockholm archipelago, <clears throat> the rate of, of this exploitation is, is a couple of percent per year. 
So if you project this further, um, uh, there will be no habitat left for these species. Uh, <clears throat> another impacting factor, uh, which is highly debated and uh, uh, not debated, but perhaps, but uh, infected a debate is the role of natural predators in, on, on coastal uh, fish or fish in general in, in the Baltic Sea. Uh, we have seen a sharp increase of, of mammals as gray seal and ring seal in the Baltic Sea, going from in the uh, 80s, a few thousands up to, uh, in, the, in the gray seal case, more than 40,000 seals around now. And of course, this is a success story. This is a top predator in the Baltic Sea. Uh, and increases like this, it actually indicates that something is okay in the Baltic Sea. Otherwise, we wouldn't see these increases. The same goes for, for the great cormorant. Uh, really sharp increases in, in the populations of great cormorants along the coast. And of course, these uh, predators, <clears throat> they feed on what's in, in, in the water and they feed on fish. Uh, so <clears throat> this is estimate from, from uh, a colleague of mine, Ulf Bergström, where they looked at the diet of, of, of seals, gray seal and cormorant, uh, and scaled it up uh, to consumptions, total consumptions. And <clears throat> if you look at perch uh, and compare it to fishing, the cormorants are totally uh, outnumbering um, the outtake of this species. Uh, seal consume less perch, but still in the same magnitude as fishing. Uh, when it comes to, comes to pike, uh, seals seem to be consuming more than, 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 than the cormorants, not surprisingly, since pike are a, a, a bigger uh, 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 fish compared to, to, to perch. Uh, but still, substantial outtake also from, from, from uh, birds and, and seals here. Uh, taking the Baltic Sea as a whole, uh, humans land uh, uh, much more fish than compared to these natural predators, if you include the herring and uh, sprat fishery, for example. Uh, but the big question is, uh, do these the natural predators also uh, impact the amount of fish in, in, in the sea? Uh, do they have a reg uh, regulatory control of the fish? Uh, and there are in the, uh, actually accumulating evidence that, that they are affecting the, the, the stocks, uh, especially when the stocks are vulnerable and, and, or when the stocks are in, in poor conditions, they can have a quite severe effect. Uh, at the same time, uh, the natural predators are part of the system as we humans are. So um, uh, they need to eat something, and of course they, they eat fish. But it, this comes down to a lot of conflicts with humans. Uh, <clears throat> going back to, to the same picture, uh, I would like to finally uh, discuss um, fishing impact of coastal fish. Uh, so this is the same fi fi figure, and as you can see, both for perch and pike, at least in this surveyed area, uh, uh, recreational fishing is vastly outnumbering the, the landings of, of, of the commercial fish. And this is actually true, true in, in many Baltic countries, but not in all. Therefore, I wrote a question mark. In some, some, some countries, actually, the small-scale coastal fishery uh, uh, have higher landings uh, or take more fish than, than the recreational fishermen. But in, in general, I would say that the recreational fi uh, fishing is more important than the commercial fishing when it comes to coastal uh, species. So what is then the effect of, of fishing on, on, on the recipient stocks? <clears throat> uh, it's quite uh, uh, intuitive that fishing, if you, if you fish a lot, you remove fish and it impacts the stock. But uh, there's very, very few evidence on this in the Baltic Sea um, at the moment, uh, especially for, for, for coastal fish species. Uh, and the, uh, the few evidence there is um, shows that they have, fishing has an impact. So this figure shows uh, this figure shows pike perch in the Stockholm archipelago. The figure I showed you before, and this is pike in the very same area. So 2011, uh, this uh, the, the area uh, denoted by an orange line here, uh, uh, a fishing ban was introduced. And what you can see is for both pike and perch, 
this is large pike and perch over 40 centimeters. The catches in our monitoring increased quite substantially after the fishing ban. So fish, um, uh, fishing affects the fish. So <clears throat> I think I have sh shown a pretty sad story. <laughs> uh, a lot of populations go down. Um, we have severe impacts on, 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 the, on the populations. So one can then question, so is there any hope left for coastal fish in the Baltic Sea? Um, and I would say strongly argue for sure there is. I mean, none of these, a lot of populations are going down, but there's still quite a lot of fish in the, in the sea. Uh, but we need to do something uh, and have strong uh, actions uh, and, and decisions to, to and perhaps set aside human interest to some extent here to protect these species. So uh, uh, I have made a, a list here of, of measures that I think have positive effects uh, on coastal fish populations, um, uh, where we have uh, only evidence, uh, strong evidence for the first three ones that they have an impact because they have, have, have been evaluated. So fishing restrictions, as I showed, it could both be complete no-take zones, uh, uh, but also temporal closures. And when discussing um, MPAs, uh, I think the MPAs need to be designed so there is no fishing. You know, otherwise, in my world, it's not an MPA. Uh, fish is part of the system. <clears throat> uh, we need to protect the essential habitats. We need to stop the exploitation of uh, shallow coastal systems. Uh, and this includes both physical exploitation by building piers, uh, harbors and such, such, but it also includes um, uh, excluding boating from, from, from these sensitive areas. And in my mind, uh, the most important thing when it comes to boating is actually uh, turbulence and, and stirring up a lot of, of sediments uh, when, when, when um, going through shallow coastal bays. But I think given the thing that Peter said, uh, sound might be um, really important as well from these uh, boat moves. And what we know, if you go out a uh, sunny day in the archipelago, at least in Sweden, there's not many people who are using electric motors and small motors. The motors just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the bigger the motors, the, the bigger turbulence and the bigger sound. So uh, another thing of importance uh, is if we can't protect uh, fish and their habitats, uh, we should restore the habitats. But I think restoring is just something we need to do if it's damaged. It's much better to protect to, than to restore. And rest restoration can be at the coast, where you can open up flats, uh, overgrown habitats. Uh, but it could also include uh, opening up uh, fish passages in, in coastal tributaries and restoring wetlands and spawning areas. Because a lot of these uh, uh, species, they are of freshwater region and they actually migrate up to freshwater to spawn. Uh, another key thing is, is to more, uh, more even, uh, more, move even more into uh, an ecosystem-based approach to management, where we actually include a lot of uh, different interests and also consider the effects of natural predators. Um, you could do this in, in different ways. You could uh, uh, hunt down uh, seals and, 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 and cormorants in areas where they're problematic, but it could also very well be that we, we consider the effects of these uh, animals when designing management plans. So uh, that we share the resource, which I think is not done too, so much today. It's more, it's we or them, uh, which I think is, is the wrong way to go. We should also consider climate effects in management similarly. Uh, so we know that climate uh, impact the fish. Uh, some are uh, benefited and some are, are, are uh, have a disadvantage of, of, of the climate impact. So we need to consider this when, when uh, um, uh, designing management plans. We need to <clears throat> reduce eutrophication and slow down climate change. Also, this is very slow processes, but they, we need to actively work on this because it will benefit coastal fish populations, even though some of the species are favored by eutrophication and climate change. And as a scientist, I must say we need more 
information and more knowledge. Perhaps it's boring, but uh, I think it's true, especially when it comes to measures evaluation. Because uh, in Sweden and in the, in the Baltic Sea, we have done a lot of measures, but they have seldom been critically evaluated. So we don't have a really good toolbox for what to do. And we also need to consider cumulative impacts uh, of these pressures and not looking at them one by one. So <clears throat> I would just like to, to round off with, with uh, a short movie uh, and a, a slide uh, advertising what we at SLU uh, does when it comes to the Baltic Sea and the Baltic Sea drainage area. So here's a picture, schematic pictures of, of, of a landscape entering the sea. And uh, at SLU, we are a quite unique university, at least in Sweden. I'm not, not sure in the other uh, countries around the Baltic Sea that we are actually uh, working a lot with water from its sources up in the mountains via lakes, streams, rivers, and dams, agricultural land, forests, cities, coastal areas, all the way out to the ocean. So we have the whole continuum here, which is quite unique. And as I learned from Nils, some of you are uh, younger, younger than Nils, and perhaps uh, aiming at some uh, university studies. And I would highly recommend you to go to SLU if you want to study these kind of things. And I show. Uh, I would like to end with a, with a short movie uh, advertising this. It's two minutes long. Hope you can bear with me. If I can change my slide. You're in a place where new thoughts are born and new knowledge is created. Here we ask the big questions about animals, nature and life. SLU has the knowledge and tools to bring about genuine change. We contribute to something greater and life-changing. Our planet is fantastic. For thousands of years, humans have evolved in tandem with the natural environment and learned to make use of the resources and sustenance that the planet supplies. Today, we are facing completely new challenges. Climate change that will lead to global warming and rising sea levels is becoming increasingly apparent. Together, we must create the best conditions for a sustainable future. SLU is a world-class international university focusing on the very foundations of our existence. Clean water, a living landscape, sustainable food production, high standards of animal welfare and sustainable cities. We bring together people who have different perspectives, but they all have one and the same goal, to create the best conditions for every living thing on our planet. In order to succeed, we must have the courage to question and challenge. We must seek out new paths and be open to new solutions. By seeing things nobody has seen before and thinking of ideas nobody has thought of before, we are contributing to real change. Through education, research and environmental assessment, we are creating the right conditions for a sustainable, thriving and better world. SLU is a world-class university for education and research. We have campuses all over Sweden. We offer many popular and unique programs based on our strength and profile areas. Bio-based economy, environment, health and well-being. SLU graduates are highly sought after on the labour market. SLU is Sweden's largest provider of environmental monitoring services and our expertise is in great demand, both nationally and internationally. The knowledge we generate is used to advise government authorities and politicians in their decision-making processes. We bring people together who can share their opinions and contribute to a sustainable, thriving and better world. Welcome to SLU. There it goes. Yeah. So, great branding deluxe. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> God. Um, yeah, and uh, that was my final slide. So, uh, thanks for listening. And in case you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. And if there's some time left.